So in the um, upcoming or just recently passed lab weekend, depending on when you're listening to this lecture, um, you will or will have had um, an opportunity to palpate structures in the elbow and forearm and to um, work on functional considerations in muscles. So um, we're going to go through the osteology again, just like we always do. Um, so the elbow joint, it's a fairly simple joint, but just like all of them, it's not as simple as it seems. Um, it's actually a few joints uh, clumped together. Four bones related to the function of the elbow and forearm complex include, uh, surprise, surprise, the scapula, um, because the triceps, uh, long head of the triceps attached to the scapula, the um, uh, inferior glenoid tubercle, the distal humerus, the ulna, and the radius. So just like always, it seems like uh, something really simple, and, and yet it's more complex. Isn't that interesting about the body? So the scapula, just as a review, and we're only going to review the um, uh, landmarks that are relevant to the elbow. Um, the coracoid process uh, is the proximal attachment of the short head of the biceps. So the biceps are major elbow flexor, and so we're just reviewing that. Supraglenoid tubercle is the proximal attachment of the long head of the biceps. And the infraglenoid tubercle um, is the proximal attachment for the long head of the triceps. So um, we have the biceps and triceps brachii are um, two joint muscles. We can get into issues with active and passive insufficiency, just like we talked about with the two joint muscles in the lower extremity. So um, between the elbow and the shoulder, they have to uh, work it out who's going to get... Um, more of the link tension relationship for uh, biceps and triceps. So we will uh, talk more about that. So the distal humerus, um, the uh, medial side of the distal humerus is called the trochlea. Um, trochlea is the Latin word for spool. And if you look at the trochlea, it does sort of look like a spool of thread. You know, it's shaped like that. It's the spool-shaped uh, spool structure on the medial side of the distal humerus, and it articulates with the ulna to form the um, humeral ulnar joint, which is what we really consider as our elbow joint. Um, the coronoid fossa is a small pit located just superior to the trochlea, and it accepts the coronoid process of the ulna when the elbow is fully flexed. So it's that little dent on the anterior surface of the distal humerus. So um, on the lateral side, lateral to the trochlea, we have the capitulum. The capitulum is a, a rounded little head um, that articulates with the head of the humerus to form the humeral radial joint, and that's our major pivot joint in our forearm. So we can do forearm pronation and supination, which is very important for a lot of our functional tasks. Um, the, Humerus has epicondyles, just like the femur has epicondyles. So, of course, on any lab practicals, I want you to specify um, it's the medial epicondyle of the humerus or of the femur. Um, so, of the humerus, the medial epicondyle is the prominent bone projection on the distal humerus's medial side. And it serves as a proximal attachment for most of the wrist flexor muscles and some of the finger flexors. Um, and the pronator teres, and the medial collateral ligament of the elbow. So a big bone projection, lots of attachments. Sounds familiar, right? So the lateral epicondyle, you will not be surprised to find out, is on the lateral side of the distal humerus. And it's a proximal attachment for most of the wrist extensor muscles, the supinator muscle and the lateral collateral elbow ligament. So just like the knee and the ankle and the wrist and everything, we have lateral and medial collateral ligaments. So those are our uh, lateral stabilizers. Um, we also have superior to the epicondyles on the medial and lateral side, we have this ridge of bone that's called a supracondylar ridge. Um, we have those on the femur as well. Um, but on the uh, medial femur, the adductor tubercle is on what would be the supracondylar ridge. So it's immediately proximal to both epicondyles, and that's, again, an attachment site for muscles.
So the Electronon fossa, it's um, on the posterior side of the distal humerus, relatively deep, broad pit. Um, it is palpable, but the triceps tendon gets in the way, so you have to make sure whoever you're palpating, even if it's yourself, is relaxing their triceps, not uh, actively extending the elbow, so you can get your finger into that Electronon fossa. So um, it accepts the Electronon process, um, for that elbow articulation between the humerus and the ulna. Oh my gosh, it's my pictures from Scotland. It's the Loch Ness Monster. No, wait, it's the ulna. <laughs> um, so that the olecranon process is the pointy part on the end. It's the large, blunt, proximal tip of the ulna. Um, it has a rough posterior surface that is the distal attachment for the triceps muscles. Like, our, like all of our other bones, um, a rough, bumpy surface is an attachment for muscles. The trochlear notch is the jaw-like curvature of the mouth of the Loch Ness Monster, um, it, the proximal ulna that articulates with the trochlea. So the trochlear notch on the ulna articulates with the trochlea of the distal humerus. Some of these things make sense. Some of them don't, but it's nice when they do, right? Um, the inferior tip of the trochlear notch comes to a point that forms the coronoid process. And that coronoid process articulates with the coronoid fossa and the um, anterior part of the distal humerus. So it all fits together like a lovely little puzzle. And it's all coated with articular cartilage, so it all slides together um, in a nice way. So um, this is one of the most obvious convex concave relationships in our body. Um, and it's nice because, wow, you can really tell which is convex and which is concave. So um, the coronoid process, it's that pointy little um, part anterior on the um, ulnar trochlea, a trochlear notch. Um, the, it strengthens the articulation of the humeral ulnar joint by sort of firmly grabbing the trochlea. So when we look at that jaw of the trochlear notch, that Loch Ness Monster jaw, it really locks the um, ulna onto the trochlea of the humerus. So it grabs onto there, which is great. So we have that nice stability in our elbows. We have a lot of other structures for stability, of course, and we will talk about all of those. So the radial notch is slightly inferior and lateral to the trochlear notch. So in this picture, you can see it nicely. Um, it's, it's on that um, lateral side. And just like in the, um, with the tibia and fibula, where the notch is named after the other bone, the radial notch is on the ulna. There's an ulnar notch on the radius um, at the distal end. So the radial notch is on the ulna, slightly inferior and lateral to the trochlear notch, and it articulates with the radial head to form the proximal radio ulnar joint, and that's our major pivot joint in our forearm. Um, the styloid process of the um, ulna is a pointed projection of bone that arises from the ulnar head. So that's way down at the distal end, um, It's and you can palpate it. It's a pointy thing on your wrist. Um, so a lot of the uh, styloid processes are usually a pointy projection of bone at the end of a bone. So we have a styloid process on the ulna, we have a radial styloid process, um, we have a styloid process on the fifth metatarsal, um, which is where the peroneus brevis attaches. So styloid processes, you will not be surprised to hear that they are um, attachments for muscles. So just like the epicondyles, um, different bones have them. So if you're specifying a styloid process, you want to say the styloid process of the ulna. Or if you really want to make me happy, the, uh, I know that's a major concern of yours, but <laughs> the styloid process of the distal ulna. That's you, as specific as you can be is um, the best thing because you want to uh, make sure you're not confusing anything with, um, with another similar structure. So um, going on to the radius, we're going to start at the proximal end where we have the radial head. And it is a, a, sh a wide disc. Um, at the proximal end of the radius. And you can palpate the radial head on someone. 
Um, we're going to do it in lab, or maybe you've already done it in lab if you're listening to this lecture after lab. Um, it's sometimes, if someone has huge, like, Popeye muscular forearms, you might not be able to get in deep enough to palpate the radial head, but on most people, you can palpate it either anteriorly or posteriorly. So we will we'll find it in, um, it's, uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to, to palpate because you're trying to um, figure out what's going on with the articulation there. So the superior surface of the radial head consists of a shallow cup-shaped depression called the fovea. Remember there was a fovea on the head of the femur too. So if we're going to say fovea, we're going to have to say the fovea of the radial head to make sure we distinguish that from the other fovea. There's also a fovea in the eye. So, um, you know, let's just specify where we are. Um, that fovea of the radial head articulates with the humeral capitulum, forming the humo, uh, humeral radial joint. So that's that pivot joint. Um, the, so you can see how that little disc can spin on the round um, capitulum. Uh, pretty cool how that works. And we can move in the transverse plane for that forearm pronation and supination. So the bicipital tuberosity um, it is palpable, even though there's a lot of muscle there, um, you can palpate it. It's an enlarged ridge of bone located on the anterior medial aspect of the proximal radius. Um, it's the primary distal attachment for the biceps brachii. So the biceps brachii is a big, huge muscle. It has a big, huge knot to attach to on the bone. And that is the bicipital tuberosity. It's also known as the radial tuberosity. So the biceps um, are um, one of our major supinators. So it grabs onto that um, radial tuberosity and rotates that radius outward, laterally. Um, the styloid process of the radius is down at the distal end. It's the point of protection, uh, projection of bone off of the distal lateral radius. And you can palpate it um, just distal to your thumb, it's that little pointy part on your wrist. Um, the ulnar notch is on the radius, just like the radial notch was on the ulna. Um, the ulnar notch is a small depression on the medial side of the distal radius that articulates with the ulnar head. So you can, when you look at the radius and ulna here in this picture, you can sort of see they, they almost have like a re reverse relationship. Um, the, the wider um, part of the ulna is superior or proximal. The smaller head is distal or inferior. The small head of the radius is superior or proximal, and the big, broad base of the radius is inferior or distal. So they have that kind of inverse relationship. And sort of how they twist against each other, whoops, there goes my PowerPoint. Hey, let's get that back. <laughs> so um, the way they twist against each other sort of uh, is the formation of that um, forearm motion we do for that functional motion of supination and pronation. Um, there's also an interosseous membrane between the two, just like there is between the tibia and fibula, to help um, distribute some of the forces, and we'll talk about how that works. So. We have the two joints, the humeral ulnar joint um, and the humeral radial joint. So the humeral ulnar joint provides most of the elbow structural stability by that trochlear notch interlocking with the trochlea. The olecranon process goes into the olecranon fossa and on the other end, the coronoid process goes into the coronoid fossa and it locks right onto that spool, that trochlea. Um, so by having that stable um, interlocking joint, it limits the motion of, el of the elbow to flexion and extension. So the elbow is your classic hinge joint, one degree of freedom, um, flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. The humeral radial joint is formed by the capitulum articulating with the fovea of the head of the radius. Um, it, so that articulation permits continuous contact between the radial head and the capitulum during supination, pronation, flexion, and extension. So when the um, humeral ulnar joint is flexing and extending, the humeral radial joint is gliding, the, the um, head of the 
radius is gliding on the capitulum, um, when the you're doing supination and pronation, the head of the radius is spinning on the capitulum. So um, it's a really interesting interaction of two joints for the functional movements that we do with our lower um, arm. So we have, um, because of the arrangement of the trochlea and the capitulum, you can, you can see a little bit in this picture how um, the trochlea on the medial side goes a little bit more inferior than the capitulum on the lateral side. So we end up with this, um, what we call our normal cubitus valgus, which is where the natural outward angulation of the forearm within the frontal plane. Um, it's called the carrying angle because of its function of keeping a carried object away from the body. You can imagine if our um, if we had cubitus varus like in that third um, picture there in picture C, the arms really close to the body, the forearms really close to the body, and it's a, um, you have to engage the shoulder a little bit more to keep a carried object away from the body, and it takes it farther away from your center of gravity, so it requires more torque to lift something. So with that um, carrying angle, the normal cubitus valgus, um, you can still keep the weight of it in your body and have the object a little bit away from your body that you're carrying. So really interesting. Elbow trauma can result in either excessive cubitus valgus or excessive cubitus varus. So um, a lot of times injuries to the elbow are caused by trauma. Um, I will share with you my elbow trauma story. Um, it happened in the late 80s <laughs> when I was a ski patroller and I was off my skis pounding in a snow fence that was higher than my head with a 15 pound mini sledgehammer. Um, the wind blew the fence back and knocked me off balance and um, basically my center of gravity got outside of my base of support and it pulled the um, the weight of the hammer back behind my body so my arms up over my head the hammer's getting pulled back. I let go of the hammer and dropped it, but before I was able to drop it, um, there was a lot of uh, twisting force on my shoulder, my elbow, and my wrist, um, resulting in shoulder, elbow, and wrist injuries. So I had a lot of soft tissue injuries. Luckily, no, um, no bones were no bones were harmed in the um, telling of this story. But um, so the, the soft tissue injuries, I spent a lot of time in PT rehabbing from those, and unfortunately I was out for the rest of the season um, with skiing. That's just unfortunate. But, um, and with working. So um, those traumatic injuries in the late 80s, um, you know, 8 to 10 years later developed into um, overuse injuries and um, tendonitis. So... Um, you can have sequelae or follow-ups from injuries that last for years and years afterwards. Um, so I guess the, the moral of the story is uh, keep a wide base of support when you're pounding in a snow fence, but the other moral of the story is that um, elbow trauma can do a lot of damage, and, um, and then you can um, end up uh, later on with the consequences of that. Um, one of my sisters uh, used to be a police officer, and she competed in powerlifting in the police and fire games. And um, she ended up with elbow injuries um, because of her powerlifting past. Um, she does pretty well with it now. She's a she owns a yoga studio, but um, she had trouble with uh, elbow issues um, sometime after that, just because of the trauma from doing the powerlifting. So the elbow um, has a lot of supporting structures, just like all the joints. The articular capsule, and it's a pretty thin capsule. I mean, we can palpate a lot of the stuff through the capsule. Um, it's an expansive band of connective tissue enclosing um, all the joints. So the humeral ulnar, the humeroradial, and the radio ulnar joint. So um, it's um, enclosing all of that. And then we have the medial and collateral ligaments um, to prevent varus and valgus stress. So the medial collateral ligament attaches proximally to the medial epicondyle of the humerus and distally to the medial aspects of the coronoid and olecranon processes. 
So it provides stability by resisting cubitus valgus producing forces. Um, and you can see that um, medial collateral ligament, how it's going to do that. When you go into more valgus, the ligament is on stretch. The lateral collateral ligament originates on the lateral epicondyle and splits into two fiber bundles known as the radial collateral ligament, which attaches to the annular ligament um, that goes around the radial head, um, and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which attaches to the lateral aspect of the proximal ulna. So um, it is more extensive than some of our other lateral collateral ligaments. Um, it provides elbow stability by resisting cubitus varus producing forces. So in the knee, remember that there um, there aren't as many varus producing forces as valgus producing forces because the other leg is protecting you. But in the arm, the elbow is more vulnerable because we're reaching and our arms are out um, trying to affect the world around us. And um, so we are more prone to varus producing forces in the elbow than we are in the knee. So that lateral collateral ligament has to be more um, vigilant, I guess we'll say, in the elbow than in the knee. So I like this picture. It's a Netter picture. Um, I'm just really super fond of um, Netter anatomy books. Um, it has just really good pictures of the ligaments, which I love. Um, the medial and lateral collateral ligaments that um, limit excessive varus and valgus deformations um, the medial collateral ligament is most often injured during attempts to catch yourself from a fall. So you fall and you just naturally, that crossed extensor reflex, you send your arm out to catch yourself. Um, so the ligaments become taut at the extremes of flexion and extension. So extremes of flexion and extension can also damage the collateral ligaments because you go into one of those extremes and then you put force on it um, you're going to have force on those ligaments. So um, the elbow is a, a uh, joint like the knee that is often subject to trauma, but unlike the knee, we don't have to walk around on it, so it's a little bit easier to recover from an elbow injury. Although it took years to recover from my stupid elbow injury, so um, I guess I can't say that it's easy. Um, the elbow flexion extension occur in the sagittal plane about a medial lateral axis of rotation, just like most flexion and extension motions. So the, um, the medial lateral axis of rotation goes right through both epicondyles, right? So you can, you can imagine that skewer going through the epicondyles, and we have that flexion extension. The normal range of motion at the elbow um, spans from 5 degrees past um, full extension to 145 degrees of flexion. Most activities use a more limited arc of motion between 30 and 130 degrees of flexion. So even if people don't have um, full extension, um, they can still have full functional movement. So um, the elbow is a pretty versatile joint and um, most of our activities are not at its end range, which makes sense really. Um, so the uh, if at the uh, mid-range, of course, we have um, better actinomyosin crossover for the muscles. Um, we have um, more functional stability in the ligaments because we're not at those extremes of flexion and extension. So it makes sense that the functional activities are in that um, middle arc. So when I had my um, elbow injury, um, I, I was at 180 degrees, or um, zero degrees really, full extension of the elbow. Um, but it was, I, I have, I naturally have a little bit more than that as I reach out. And I remember our cats were kittens at the time. Um, well, that was many, many years ago. So those cats are all in cat heaven, but uh, kittens are zinging around the house and you reach out to grab them. And I remember reaching out to grab a kitten and, um, going into, uh, my, what would be my normal full extension. And it was quite painful. So even though grabbing kittens isn't a normal functional activity, um, it could be. So um, we've got the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. So um, that's those are considered the forearm joints, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and just like the tibia and fibula, where we have the proximal and distal tibiofibular joints, 
um, they they have that interosseous membrane to um, uh, act as muscle attachment sites and to um, redirect forces a little bit. So pronation and supination occur as a result of the motion of the um, proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. Um, pronation and supination do not occur at the wrist or hand. It's definitely a forearm motion. So um, the firm articulation between the distal radius and the carpal bones um, requires that the hand follows the rotation of the radius. So a lot of times when we're talking about pronation and supination, we use the hand as a reference point. So when you're supinated, your palm is facing anteriorly. Um, when you're pronated, it's facing posteriorly. But it doesn't happen at the wrist. It happens at the forearm. And because the, the uh, distal radius and carpal bones have those tight um, articulations, it, they go along for the ride, if that makes any sense. So we talk about uh, supination and pronation. Supination, the um, palms are facing anteriorly. That's our classic anatomical position. Um, pronation, they're facing posteriorly. When the elbow is bent at 90 degrees, which is often a functional position, um, in supination, the palms are facing upwards like you're holding a bowl of soup. It's a way to remember supination. Um, and in pronation of the forearms, the palms are facing downward um, or inferiorly, like you're dumping out your soup. So um, the supporting structures of the proximal and distal um, radial ulnar joints include the annular ligament, which is a thick circular band of connective tissue that wraps around the radial head and attaches to either side of the radial notch of the ulna. Um, so it holds the radial head firmly against the ulna, but it allows it to spin freely during supination and pronation. So it's kind of cool. It's, it's kind of like, um, like a fan belt in a machine or in your car. Um, so the um, fan can spin inside, but the belt holds it um, where it needs to stay. So um, pretty neat, I think, the annular ligament. Um, the distal radial ulnar joint capsule is reinforced by the palmar and dorsal capsular ligaments of the wrist, and it provides stability to that distal radial ulnar joint. So um, if we're talking about stability versus mobility, the distal joint is more stable. The um, proximal joint is more mobile, even though it's pretty stable. The interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna also help bind the radius to the ulna, and they serve as a site for muscular attachments and a mechanism to transmit forces proximally through the forearm. Um, that's pretty important, and we'll talk more about that. So in terms of kinematics, supination occurs in a lot of functional activities that require the palm to be turned up. That's your bowl of soup, holding the bowl of soup, supination. Um, and pronation is involved with activities that require the palm to be turned down, like pushing up from a chair. That's a functional activity that a lot of people do every day. Um, so use, a lot of times when we're talking about pronation and supination, we're talking about it in that plane where the elbow is bent to 90 degrees. So um, the, it's interesting to... Um, explore that relationship and we're going to do some exercise in lab or if you're listening to this lecture after the lab um, we have done them <laughs> so the force of gravity is going to be different um, going from neutral to supination neutral to pronation whether gravity is the force or um, gravity is the resistance and um, it's all involved in our functional activities so I've worked with a lot of people in the clinic who have elbow injuries, and it's usually as a result of trauma. Um, one of the interesting uh, pronation supination um, injuries that I worked with, um, there was a nice guy who uh, was a truck driver. He was uh, jumping down from his truck, and uh, those bigger trucks, a lot of times they have a handle that you can hold on to, like a grab bar. Um, and he grabbed onto the bar and he jumped down, his feet landed on ice and slipped out from underneath him and did damage at his elbow and his shoulder. And um, sort of the opposite of my elbow and shoulder injury, uh, mine was open chain, his was closed chain. <laughs> so 
um, but uh, both involving snow and ice and wind. So um, he had surgery, so he had a plate in um, his forearm, and it limited his supination. So supination is important for things like bringing food to your mouth and um, shaving. So he was coming into PT for three, time, three times a week for a while, and he couldn't shave because he couldn't get his hand into that position, and it was his dominant hand, and he just didn't feel safe shaving with his non-dominant hand. So um, we were working on his supination motion and even had a dynamic splint at one point, and we were also working on his shoulder. And one day, he, so he had this big old beard because he hadn't been able to shave for a while. One day he came in, he was clean shaven. We almost didn't recognize him, um, but he had finally gotten enough motion where he could uh, supinate enough to shave. So that was pretty cool. It was a, a neat milestone, but it just shows you how much um, supination and pronation function in um, functional movements like shaving or eating. So um, supination and pronation occur as the radius rotates around an axis of rotation that travels from the radial head um, proximally to the ulnar head distally. So zero degrees or the neutral position of the forearm is the thumbs up position. So when you're giving someone with thumbs up, that's zero degrees. From this position, you normally have about 85 degrees of supination and 75 degrees of pronation. And um, it's, it's restricted by the interosseous membrane and the ligaments. So it's, the, whereas the humero ulnar joint is your classic textbook example of a hard end feel because it's bone hitting bone at the end range, um, humero ulnar extension, pronation and supination are more of a firm end feel because it's muscle and um, connective tissue stretching that is uh, allowing us to reach the end feel. So um, with the humerus fixed and the forearm free, um, the orthokinematics of supination and pronation, the radius moves and the ulna stays stationary. Because the ulna is, um, that trochlear notch is um, articulating with the trochlea, it's pretty stable, um, and the radial head can move. So usually the radial head spins in place in the direction of the thumb. Um, since the radius rolls and slides in the same direction relative to the um, ulnar head, um, the distal radius in other words, so the proximal radius is a spin, the distal radius is a roll and slide. So you get two different um, kinematic, uh, arthrokinematic schemes in that one motion. Kind of cool, right? So when we were working with our, our guy with the um, beard <laughs> who couldn't shave, um, we were working a lot on um, motion at both ends of the radius to, and, and the soft tissue in between too to help him get his motion back. So um, the arthrokinematics of pronation are essentially the same as su supination but in reverse. So during supination the radial head spins in the direction of the thumb and the spinning head of the radius also makes contact with the capitulum of the humerus. So at the distal radial ulnar joint, the concave surface of the distal radius rolls and slides in the same direction across the stationary convex ulna. Um, 